You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. This play is a part of a language reclamation project mm -hmm. involving three First Nations languages. And why do you think language reclamation is super important? Um, well, um, the numbers of speakers are, are uh, Fluent speakers are um, decreasing by the year. And uh, since theater is, um, is a, a public event that will attract uh, uh, large numbers of Como uh, indigenous people, um, at, the, at the bottom of my thinking was that um, since the status of BC first, First Nations languages, the report, there's an annual or biannual report that comes out. They, the report misses uh, a good portion of my demographic um, because we're, we're living in urban areas. And that's an important group, I think, to try to reach. Uh, and I was hoping that we could reach a fair number with, with theater and especially with this topic because it, it touches everybody everybody's communal history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Althea from Live on Gabriela TV. I recently interviewed some of the cast and crew of the scenes from the Nanaimo Indian Hospital Theater performance. As a residential school and Indian hospital survivor, Dr. Laura Cranmer of Nagis and Haida Descent wrote this play based on her three-year experience at the hospital as a child. A brief history, Nanaimo Indian Hospital operated from the 1940s until the 1960s. With about 220 beds, it was the second largest in Western Canada. Indian hospitals at the time racially segregated their patients. As written in the program for the play, they were usually underfunded, overcrowded, found in a basement, and hidden away from the sanitary spaces designated for the non-Indigenous population. The hospital was a place meant to treat patients with tuberculosis, and although oral drug treatments to cure the disease were later introduced, the Indian hospitals continued their experimental treatments on patients and refused to let them leave. Scene from the Naimo Indian Hospital features a story of how three little girls, representing three indigenous language families of Vancouver Island, grow their friendship and share their memories in each of their own languages. In the interview, we discuss the production process, the cast and crew's background and involvement, healing, revisiting and unveiling repressed history, what it means to rewrite the colonial script, and the crucial significance of language reclamation. Here's the interview. First, I want to say thank you everyone for being here. I know an interview can be a bit intimidating, especially if you're not prepared, but I'm still, I still appreciate everyone here. Um, uh, my name is Althea, and I'll be your interviewer for today. <laughs> you know, you can just take this as a casual conversation that just happens to be on camera. <laughs> no pressure at all. <laughs> So maybe I'll start with, um, you know, going back a little bit. Can can you explain how did the cast and crew first come together? Wow. Gosh, that's going back how many years now? <laughs> 2021. Well, yeah. 2020, we applied for the first grant. Mm -hmm. Then in the midst of that, you had the Western Edge reading. Yeah, that was February 14th, 2022. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yep. 2022. Yeah. And then from there, everything boomed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's kind of, we, we come together with some language speakers that we know are language learners. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of onboarded with those, and some are still here and some are not. Mm -hmm. yeah. At the time, Laura was my professor, mm -hmm. and she asked, 
she asked me if I had anyone, if I knew anyone who was either a language learner, a new child language learner, or um, new language. And I suggested my niece, Hannah, plays Mary. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you have to go to specific locations to meet? I know everyone's here like from different places and yeah, how did you organize those kind of meetings? Um, it was more of an organic formation, I think. It was based on who, who we could call upon who lived close by because the the distances covered by the three languages are quite large distances, yeah. So uh, the, the indigenous population in Nanaimo was uh, quite, quite large, what, the, what is called off-reserve population, plus well, as Nanaimo to our hosts, yeah. We also had two um, settler actors prior um, that uh, couldn't continue due to their, uh, they had other obligations. And one of our actors who was here before, a uh, Coapola speaker, um, suggested, she sent me a picture of Kim, said, I know this great actress, Kim. <laughs> and Kim just happened to have been my neighbor. <laughs> so, and then Kim and Ross to go back far mm -hmm. as well. And so Kim, we were really fortunate with Kim and Ross's expertise in, uh, especially comes in directing and mm -hmm. um, and just really supporting all of us in knowing how to act as well, and learning how to act. Mm -hmm. Because we're, we're non-actors, non mostly. Sometimes it's good to have interesting neighbors. To <laughs> 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 take, take care of your kids, do this so. <laughs> Definitely. You know, there's a use of connections, and especially when it comes to physical connection, and I find it is really cool when it comes yeah. to this. Mm -hmm. And this play is a part of a language reclamation project mm -hmm. involving three First Nations languages. And why do you think language reclamation is super important? Um, well, um, the numbers of speakers are, are uh, fluent speakers are, um, decreasing by the year. And uh, since theater is, um, is a, a public event that will attract uh, uh, large numbers of Como uh, indigenous people, um, at, the, at the bottom of my thinking was that um, since the status of BC first, First Nations languages, the report, there's an annual or biannual report that comes out. They, the report misses uh, a good portion of my demographic um, because we're, we're living in urban areas. And that's an important group, I think, to try to reach. Uh, and I was hoping that we could reach a fair number with, with theater and especially with this topic because it, it touches everybody everybody's communal history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's definitely, can, it can be difficult when it comes to trying to understand it and trying to share it with other people that might not be on the same page or mm -hmm. as in, mm -hmm. you know, they have different experience. So. Mm -hmm. And I find it also, you know, this is definitely what we need. It's like we, more yeah. of these are important mm -hmm. to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It takes, for everyone, it takes great spirits and willingness to engage in such a difficult topic mm -hmm. to create this educational mm -hmm. play script. Yeah. Um, the play is based on experiences that might experience by more than one people. Mm -hmm. Even we have like many people who mm -hmm. don't know that stuff. And when it comes to di those diverse experiences, I wonder why you chose theater as a way to write this. Uh, I think theater um, reaches uh, has the potential to reach a wide wide audience rather than a publication sitting on a dusty shelf in the library. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we bring we bring the the history and the languages alive. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm, I'm sure other people have many more responses to. <laughs> well, the theater is, is always been known to, to um, bring wide gatherings of, of diverse people. And, you know, my background in theater is, is to have combined education and entertainment so that it's not, I'm going to the theater because I need a laugh and I want to hear people sing and dance, or I'm going to be um, challenged, challenged, mm -hmm. or I'm mm -hmm. going to uh, step into something that I don't know about um, historically and or um, socially, that it opens up the doors a lot. And I think you can have people who are theater goers and non-theater goers are going to experience them. <laughs> and as you mentioned, we have the theater background. What if you find most interesting when it comes to, um, you know, creating this theater uh, play that is definitely more educational and not entertainment? Challenges. <laughs> yeah, there are challenges because, mm -hmm. um, you know, my theater background, um, I'm not going to come in with the same approach. Um, it's not going to be A, B, and C. Also, it's a collective project. That's an, a, another element because there's, so there's many different opinions and ideas that need to be uh, used. And the other thing is, is that I'm a guest in this environment. And I'm also, I'm not coming in as a teacher and a director. I'm coming in as a student to learn about Indigenous stories. And, and if, if I can bring some of the theater skill to help elevate that, and still keeping in respect for cultural sharing. And, and I've learned so much. It's like, oh, okay, this is, this is how I may approach it from a theater perspective, ah, but this is a cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. And so very, very, sometimes they're very, very different. And sometimes it's like, oh, this is how they can be married to each other. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an opportunity too for indigenous um, people to, to share our stories in a language that we're not all comfortable with, but we know that our audience, people who are regular theater goers or our actors themselves will take the time and opportunity to, to attend. So we're speaking a language outside of the three language groups and English, we're speaking the language of acting, which we're not all comfortable with, <laughs> or we're getting, we're, we are, have gotten comfortable with, but we're at the start. And I think a big part of that too is like in the, the healing of it is we're um, being, uh, giving ourselves permission to be playful in these roles, yeah. which is something um, we weren't allowed to do. And I think has been taught in that, uh, like in this colonial script is that we, we've not been able to get in touch with that or that our childhoods are so, traumatic that there is no room for that. Mm -hmm. I would say, just following up on that word trauma, that this has added another layer of challenge and complexity to the work that we're doing because we're dealing with extremely sensitive trauma triggers that have personal identification with people in this room. Mm -hmm. We all have some experience connected with certain traumas that stay with us and and so here we are all coming together with our own bag full of whatever it is. And we're addressing this story, which is so moving and so challenging to play characters from this time that offend me and my sensibilities about how a doctor should care and i'm just i, I am i'm um, i'm excited to be a participant in this important storytelling and as the um as actors did you, through playing the characters did you find anything new about yourself or just you based on your learning experience uh, <laughs> so, um, I, I spent the majority of my career in the mental health field, and so I never, I dealt with racism a lot throughout my education, 
more so in high school. And drama was something that I wanted to do, but because of that, it was buried deep down. And with the help of so many talent, talented people in this room, that reawoken for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still don't consider myself an actor, even though I played in two plays publicly in front of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you know, it's it's exciting, you know, because um, I came on the, to this project just with a pure passion to provide mental health support, which I've been doing my whole career for for plays like this or mm -hmm. film screenings. Um, so, yeah, it, it's definitely um, opened, opened myself to a different side of myself. Uh, I was allowed to be, be playful because I was raised by survivors of residential school and day school and, and the Indian hospital. And so having that strict discipline to just sit, watch and listen um, and nothing else. Um, and, and yeah, the, the playing was outside with our cousins. Um, but. Yeah, so it, it definitely has allowed me to write the colonial script that lives within me. It's given me permission to play, to learn a language that my parents were forbidden to talk. Mm -hmm. Even though my dad's fluent, my mom, in a way, you know, didn't encourage it. But because of that racism, mm -hmm. I was ashamed to learn it. Mm -hmm. I was ashamed because, one, I was too dark my whole life. And so wanting to um, be lighter, wanting to not sound Indian is the word was used back then. Um, but this this is rewriting that colonial script. This is, you know, being proud that I'm learning to speak my dad's language. I'm hearing my sister speak in, in our mother's language. My, my father, our father is Kwakwala and my mother, our mother is Salish in the Hel Camino. So we have both languages that live within our blood and yeah, so it's been a journey and a healing journey at that because it wasn't easy mm -hmm. to be a back or grow it up. Mm -hmm. It wasn't easy being mm -hmm. Cuomo, grow it up, mm -hmm. being proud of it. This journey just helped me heal those wounds. That I'm proud that regardless of the age I am, I'm learning my language. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing. <laughs> this is an issue. <laughs> this is an issue where I was issue. <laughs> we go through a little bit, I think. <laughs> we just all have our own box. <laughs> 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 I want to say that like even in the intro video, um, I watched the play and there's like the, the intro video before I like, started mm -hmm. and there was the phrase that you said about, you know, um, we can we might not be able to rewrite history, oh. but we can rewrite the colonial script. Yeah. And now I was stuck inside of my head mm. for such a long time. Oh. And I feel like what you're doing right now is definitely something in like you in the most remarkable way. That's what I wanna say. Mm. You've done a really great job and even, you know, and and because um 
I, I, I thought I, I thought I kind of misheard it at first because I was thinking, well, what is a colonial script? <laughs> and then it took me one and then thing. Oh, okay, I think I got it. Because um, and also English is not my first language. Mm. So I thought I might have and did I miss a vocab or something? <laughs> but but no, even without you know, having to go dictionary, I completely understand, mm. you know, mm. what you're trying to say. Mm. Mm. And it's and I find it like there's no other way that you can rephrase it. Yeah. And I even in the, uh, in, the in the pamphlet also and there's the, there's a part about rewriting the colonial script and I think it's constantly emphasized too that that is what you're trying to do and yeah you deliver it quite like and I can't really imagine it in, other, in any other way. You, you 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 went to the Port Theater and saw one. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> I want, um, I want to ask about, um, again, about the rewriting, the colonial script. It says in a pamphlet, you know, arts are a source of the language reawakening. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit more into that, uh, what you mean by that. Um, I, th I think I, I've said this before, where when we be begin our healing journey and we go back and resolve some of the un unresolved uh, that we make room, we make room for um, old memories to come forward, as as Hannah's auntie said, and uh, De Deb Masso, she she said, um, it's in our DNA. Mm -hmm. Our languages are in our DNA, and so we are creating the conditions by and through which that that is welcome to come out and play and be remembered. Yeah, yeah. And I think through repetition, through um, puzzling through uh, the, the script the, the, in the languages um, as they're written um, is, is actually reawakening and um, putting some puzzle pieces together. Yeah, it's starting to make sense. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure other people can speak to their experience <laughs> of how, how it's reawakening, how the whole process is reawakening. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at you, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> I know all her eyes. <laughs> um, what was the question? <laughs> it's about arts um, using to reawaken language. First, I believe, you know, revitalizing, reawakening our languages, reclaiming our languages, very important. It's a part of our identity. Mm -hmm. It's a part of who we are. Mm -hmm. And our teachings and our language go hand in hand. So it's mm -hmm. like to our elders in, mm -hmm. in class. That day, it's definitely been healing. It's definitely given me confidence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, our first readings in UVic, um, the super came out and she was yelling. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> I cried. I really cried. Mm -hmm. Because I was triggered. It made me think about our parents. My mom, who was a survivor and who was in the Indian hospital. My dad, who went to day school. And when she yelled, it made me think about that. Mm -hmm. And um, it helped me understand why they were the way they were. Mm -hmm. Instant forgiveness to my parents right then and there. Mm -hmm. Understanding. But it's helped me heal. And it's helped me. It's given me my voice. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> So I'm glad that 
through this, it, it, I think it, this project also allows you to gain or regain some strength through a different power. And everyone has a process, has this process um, going mm -hmm. in different ways. Many levels. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think in a place too where we feel um, like we have to conform, mm -hmm. or that we have to let go of that part of us, like Daisy had said, with with being a student and having to go through racism, it still very much exists in this academy. So having the space and then having it created uh, safely is just, it's almost like we're taking back our space academically as well. So that we can come onto this campus and rehearse and take take back, reclaim our space. Daisy and Virginia are Snanemok and this is their land. So it's just, it's even more, it's just mm. everything on top of everything else just mm. I think helps to build a really strong foundation in what we're doing. <laughs> okay. But you need something to keep busy. What on earth will they feed you in there? I yeah. heard that the food is atrocious. No. Uh -huh. Can't you see you're scaring Dottie half to death? She'll be okay. How do you know? When have any of our relatives ever walked out of that place? La 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 la, I don't want to hear this. La 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 la. Never mind. Come and sit for a nice feed of fish and grease. There's something that should make you strong, little doggy. Go to old Pete now to clean you out and grow hair on your chest. Have you forgotten? Girls don't grow hair on their chest. We grow breasts. Yeah, punch the word breasts. Do that in We minute. grow breasts. Yeah, okay. Gavin's just teasing, but mm, doesn't that fish and Pete smell like fish? I also heard Laura say this once before and how stories, how our people are storytellers when, um, and, and how this will teach in the future. You know, well, the story part, and there was more to that, but for me, that's what stuck to me because that's how our people learned a long time ago was through oral tradition, through storytelling. And and this is an extension of that. This is this is a huge piece to to our our storytelling that um, is based on real life. Um, is based on real life experiences. And um, I think those are some of the greatest lessons. And I think those lessons are here to stay for a while. You know, someday my daughter's gonna read about this or my son is gonna read about this and he's gonna be learning from this. That that darkness it is is that fog is gonna be blown away by the truth, by our breath. That fog is gonna be pushed away because we now have our voices to to speak the truth. So a lot in those institutional places, truth telling wasn't allowed. Secrecy was was something that was the norm and it was taught. Those places taught our people how to hurt one another. Mm -hmm. When we when we talk about intergenerational trauma, that's that piece. And so the truth telling is important. Understanding why our parents were the way they were. It, it changes people's lives. Mm -hmm. And also speaking about storytelling in the play, um, there are specific scenes where you would play a video in the background with um, mm -hmm. animated mm -hmm. illustration. Mm -hmm. and I wonder if, um, you know, what, what made you decide to do this approach, those specific illustrations and in that specific way? It's not 
like uh, those kind of uh, like TV shows, cartoon where everything's fluid moving and and mm. very express or in the frames. I noticed that it's it's almost as if it's kind of stop motion, but in an illustrate in an illustrative way. I wonder what, uh, yeah, what decision, what, why pick that art style specifically? Well, maybe we could, we, we did talk about um, how to um, solve, solve that issue of the translations with possibly English subtitles, which we tried at the UVic presentation, but Anne had a wonderful uh, response to that in, in another, a previous interview. And uh, I can't really um, convey what she said, so let's rely on Anne. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think one thing we noticed at UVic is that we had translations projected up behind. So there were the actors speaking the language, yeah. but there was a lot to read. So I think you could only read or watch the actors or listen to the language. And we really want people to listen to this language because they don't get the opportunity to hear that uh, very often. And if we really think about all of those children that went into the residential schools, the day schools, the Indian hospitals, and the adults as well, that weren't allowed to speak their language. They had to go in and listen to English, learn English, speak English. They weren't allowed to speak their language. So I think this is um, just sort of turning the tables so that the audience can experience that, mm -hmm. that they have to just listen to the language, um, try to figure out what's happening, but to just get the sound of it in their ear. And then the projections, they alluded to what was being said. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, it was a deliberate uh, conscious decision to not have translations. Mm -hmm. And we know from comments that that is what, probably one of the biggest questions is why weren't there any translations so that we can explain that. Mm -hmm. so. And part of um, <clears throat> our choice to use theater like as a, as a way to share this is that art is moving and it, it, it goes to your core, to, it should hit those emotions. And so the projections were a way of sharing that language through art as well, another another piece of art. And Cinnabar Vista Productions did the animations and they did it on an extremely low budget because our funding is low. And what they created with that limited amount of funding is is just beautiful. beautiful. Mm -hmm. And time, yeah. limited time. Limited time, and with a little baby. Yeah. 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 So they um, they stated that this was just a start. That as we get more funding, they can make it um, much more elaborate and not so like stop motion. It would it would be more more flowing. But they did an amazing amazing job considering what what we had. Great first draft. Yeah. Yeah. But from a white perspective. <laughs> is that having the language and not understanding the meaning of it um, really gives an experience of this is what it was like for children and people experiencing that, that how cut off that feeling can be. And also the other thing that I learned was that with the different languages, how, you know, two children can be in the same room, but they couldn't share the language because it was slightly different, whether it's, it's Kwakula or Machal, that there's still that, con because they, you think, oh, okay, now we can talk. Oh, we, we still need to bridge this gap of language. And so um, I think having the images was um, a, a great theatrical tool to have the language of a, a monologue um, shared, and it's okay that a non-language speaker will go, oh, I, I do feel this somewhat disconnect, or, or the, and whether it's a longing to know that language, or that it's not now foreign to me, mm -hmm. or I can see what the struggles were. So I think it, it, it opens up so many different levels of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
happened to, I, Virginia had mentioned it earlier that uh, my dad was a, at the matinee and Virginia and Daisy's parents were there for both, but my dad is not a fluent speaker. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure during Hannah's monologue and even during Virginia's, um, because his mother was Salish, he didn't understand what was being said. He had to rely on projection too. And that's the truth for a lot of um, Indigenous people at any age that we're also not understanding what is being said. Mm -hmm. I also found the animation to be somewhat like a storybook yeah. that came to life. Mm -hmm. So even with just the stop motion, it's definitely more than enough to convey everything. I know, I wonder, you know, <laughs> if as you mentioned, like they, that's just the first draft. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's already more than enough. <laughs> that's so big. They, they did, they, it's amazing what they created. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And throughout the play, the three girls continuously compare each of their languages mm -hmm. and often find a difference between, you know, the context or pronunciations interesting and sometimes even amusing. In some mm -hmm. cases, it's, it might appear funny <laughs> because mm -hmm. um, some words are pronounced a certain way and means a certain way. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh no, that's a bad word. <laughs> You're not supposed to say um. <laughs> <laughs> So, Have you ever had a similar experience to that? When you, when you find a person in a different language and when you want to express certain things or say some words, apparently it sounds different in their languages or? Yeah. Well, um, pronunciation is very important. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, there's one part in Dorothy's monologue that goes, oh, where's Dorothy's monologue? <laughs> I can't believe, uh, uh, thank you. When I'm just when Dorothy's describing uh, going to the top of the stairs, and she's saying it's difficult, fahwala matlin something something, and it's very close to fahwala men nukuntus. I love you. Mm -hmm. So, difficulty and love are uh, <laughs> the, so close. They're both. How do you say that? Different so, sides of the same so coin. Not. Yeah, no, I'm just saying. They're so close, they're the different sides of the same coin. Is that the phrase <laughs> I'm looking for? Is that the one? <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> My father always said that love and hate are a circle and they meet. It begins with love and it ends with hate. They're actually right next to each other. Wow, wow. In, in the language too, in the, um, the Hebrew language? The Yiddish? No. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, Yiddish. No, it was just his philosophy of oh, hate. You, I cannot, see. you can't yeah. hate someone that you don't, haven't loved. Which I don't know if that's true, but it kind of similar with the, yeah, the, the, yeah, the it's words. Very, are it's very similar. close. Yeah. Yeah. I can't just find it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I can speak yeah. to working with the language coach. Uh -huh. Yeah. The yeah. lines that I had to do. Thank goodness I was recording them because wasn't able to speak them live on stage. But one of the words, if subtly spoken a different way, emphasis on the wrong syllable, and it was a very bad word to say, <laughs> <laughs> if you knew how to speak Kwakwa. <laughs> so um, I had to really rehearse that and be conscious of it. And I always mm -hmm. get to that word and make sure I make it through and have her standing there right beside me to make sure that I recorded it in the right way. So. Yeah. There are many <laughs> things like that that we have to yeah. be aware of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any, is there anything you'd like to share with people who are interested in learning more about um, this specific topic or any suggestions you might have? I think for me, um, as somebody who has supported survivors throughout the settlement agreement and being a part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, and yes, the truth telling is important, but for me, those who are unaware, don't have the knowledge of the history, and there's a, even our own people, you know, um, those who are frontline healthcare workers, 
Um, nurses, doctors, dentists. They don't have a, a where. I, I asked my own dentist, did she know this history? Did they teach it in your school, your training? No. I, I think it's important to, to have that awareness when they're in that field, to have a little bit more compassion and um, be trauma-informed from an Indigenous perspective. Um, our, our people wait last minute to go to the doctor. They'll wait last minute to go to the dentist because they don't want to face a, a, a place that in history hasn't treated our people well. And still today, still face racism within that system. And so to have frontline workers obtain that knowledge, because yeah, there are people who are willing to learn and listen and change, be a part of change, be a part of what reconciliation means. Um, and, and maybe their step will help others who are not ready. Um, I manage a crisis line for any residential school survivor society. And I'm sometimes thrown off by the amount of calls, the people who don't support, who don't believe what happened, who don't um, believe the dark history. And um, can be very mean. And I get it. We're all in different places when it comes to reconciliation. Um, my hope and my faith is that 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 this is a step for people who are willing to be a part of the change that's coming now. Um, that way, as I get older and my health starts to change, that I'll feel comfortable and safe to go to the hospital to my doctor, to the dentist. I won't feel like I'm going to be mistreated because I have been mistreated in all of those places. So. Well, the sad thing is that, from my perspective, we were never taught the truth about, I mean, we, we had history classes, we had social studies classes, that we would never share stories and 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 about um, you know the, the truth telling about indigenous stories and many facts about things and that's one thing that I do with theaters um, I do a lot of historical research and bring out sort of uncover some of the stories and say okay this is part of our history and we need to accept that mm -hmm. so that we can move forward and it's and, and I've never felt in this environment like I've finger pointing blame um, to me specifically is that this is the history, this is the truth and how it's been perpetuated and or ignored, not told. And so out of ignorance sometimes that my generation has stepped forward and not had this knowledge. And how dare we, once we know the, the, the knowledge, to not have better understanding, better movement, so that in an environment, whether it's doctors, nurses, care, school, anything, um, sports teams, whatever it is, that we have a better understanding of the generational traumas and how we move forward. And I don't have to take on guilt, shame. And, and I have before, I was like, I'll be like, oh my God. I just like, okay. I can do something different. I've learned so I can move on. I can move forward with doing better. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Uh, I, I think all the answers are very educational, very helpful. And I really want, once again, I want to thank you all for just being here and for all your work. And I wish this pro pro the whole project's going to go back very smoothly. Mm -hmm. It's going to be successful, and I'm excited to see where things go. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Page stop. Thank you.
Oh my god, okay. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay. Uh-oh. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay, go. <laughs> well, you'll see as soon as you get on this table, it's really not that bad. And besides, the medicine you took on the way here will help make things feel a little better. Oh, nice. Do, do you hear that? Yeah. yeah. Do I you felt hear the difference? I felt it. It's because yeah. you, you're working a little bit hard to get your message and your meaning across, yeah. right? Because you're not seeing them. And what happens is we fall into what I call a, um, 